Good evening, everyone. Aisa Toure Sar will be giving our opening. Aisa, please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roland. Good afternoon. Uh, our partners in the STEM Woman Lead Series, Roland Price, Country Manager of uh, World Bank, Bemi Disu, Executive Director for CMU Africa, distinguished speakers and moderators, representative from schools, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. I'm participating in the ongoing Shogun 2022, which is hosted in Kigali, Rwanda. The underlining messages throughout this Shogun has been in various uh, um, session is that our future lies into youth whose number has grown and need to be given, among others, access to education and skills relevant to the labor markets. The question is, as we do this, no one should be left behind, irrespective of gender. It gives me a real great pleasure to participate in the STEM Woman Lead Series once again. Let me share with you a few message that will put our discussion of this afternoon into perspective. Africa is projected to have over 840 million youth by 2050, and will, this will top the continent with the highest, the youngest population on Earth. But they will be also growing up in a new era, a great opportunity a technology-driven one dominated by the most dramatic shifts in innovations in science and technology that has never been witnessed on Earth. For too long, discrimination stereotypes have prevented women and girls Do you hear me? Yes. For too long, discrimination stereotypes have prevented women and girls from having equal access to education and science, technology, engineering, and math. And this is particularly the case in Africa. Engineering and computer science are the most lucrative STEM fields, but they remain heavily male dominated. Even though women comprises half of the population in Africa and elsewhere, they are grossly underrepresented in STEM careers. The COVID pandemic has not only hindered overall STEM education, but also particularly exacerbated the already wide gender gap. Innovative young thinkers and entrepreneurs emerging from Africa are not only changing the continent, but the world. But again, there are not enough women. We must ensure that women's participation in innovation is not the exception, but becomes the norm. Therefore, getting girls and women in STEM is not a matter of human rights, but it makes economic sense. Adopting diversity and gender inclusion in STEM is critical for increasing creativity, innovation, gender sensitive perspective for products and productivity, considering that half of the population of the world is a woman. So what we need to do to create a foster an ecosystem that nourishes the interest, talent, and intellectual capital of girls and women in STEM is training, education, career is to address these structural barriers and gaps. It is against this background that African Development Bank, together with the World Bank and CMU, have joined forces to contribute to the journey to have more women in STEM. And we have been thinking of few approaches that can be applicable. The use of role models, female role models in STEM careers that can serve as both mentors and examples of success stories. We have today a lineup of these such models, and we had had the same 
caliber in our first session. These are life testimonies to encourage our young ladies and girls to explore the world of STEM in their careers. Inculcating a culture of STEM is in a gender neutral way, but which special appeal to women and girls from early childhood and adulthood, from homes, schools, university, and labs to the tech venture. This will enable us to close the gender gap in STEM as boys are encouraged very early to pursue careers in science and STEM. Given the increased demand for STEM knowledge in a post-COVID world and education losses caused by the pandemic, support for girls in STEM education has never been more pressing. Indeed, the democratic makeup, as I said earlier, of girl and woman in Africa must be intentionally harnessed to position the continent as the technology hub for the future. Let me reiterate that African Development Bank has been investing in STEM with regards to infrastructure and transformational digital pro uh, programs. We actually make it mandatory to have gender mainstreaming in all strategies, policies, and investment. My final message to the young woman and this session is that you have to believe in yourself. You have to be confident. Don't be defined by stereotypes that goes beyond your comfort zone. You don't dream about success, but you have to work for it. If you are always to the norm, if you behave always as expected, you will never know how amazing you can be. This is um, a quote from and, uh, Maya Angelou. I'm very, again, excited to be part of this journey of discussions with our young daughters, sisters in the STEM sector. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Aisa, for those opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone in Kigali. Good afternoon, everyone in East Africa. And welcome to all of you who are elsewhere. My name is Roland Price, and I am the country manager for the World Bank in Rwanda. I am your moderator for this conversation. Along with my sisters, Aisa and Bemi, I have the distinct pleasure of bringing you the second in the STEM Women Lead series. We would like all of you who are connected to leave this conversation inspired. And so let me tell you a little bit about what we have in store for you this afternoon. I will have the opportunity to introduce our three fantastic, amazing and exceptional panelists, after which we'll have a little bit of an exchange about their schooling, their career journeys and their perspectives on women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics because I want you to get to know them as well and to feel closer to them at the end of this conversation, we will then have a Q&A session where we will take questions from the audience. And the way that we'll do that is through writing in the Q&A. If you look at the very bottom of your screen, you'll see participants, a large number, 113, welcome to each and every one of you. But also you'll see right beside that, a box that says Q&A. And if you click on that and you type your question in, we will then be able to relay those questions to the panelists. We'll have that opportunity for a little bit, I would say maybe half an hour of Q&A, so get your questions in early. And then after that, we'll have our, my sister, Bemi, who is the executive director of Carnegie Mellon University Africa. We will have her giving closing remarks. So first, let me say a little bit, just a little bit more that at the World Bank, we really care about education not just for the principal, but for the opportunity it provides. Education generally leads to good jobs. Good jobs are going to be the engine for economic growth for the world, but specifically for Africa. And some of the challenges that Africa needs to solve, we need the best thinkers, we need the best minds. And that's why we're trying to encourage everyone, but in particular women, to get into the STEM field. And so you're gonna have an, a chance to see what this 
this STEM education has led to for these three women who have very different career profiles and experiences, but all uniquely impressive. The first, and I'll ask after I've finished the um, introduction for each person to put on their cameras. The first, Dr. Amina Gurib Fakim. She is a politician, an author, an academic, a chemist. She has served as the 16th, sorry, the sixth and first female president of Mauritius between 2015 and 2018. Prior to that, she was the managing director of the Centre International de Développement Pharmaceutique, Research and Innovation, as well as a professor of organic chemistry with an endowed chair at the University of Mauritius since 2001. She served successively as Dean of the Faculty of Science and Pro Vice Chancellor. She has also worked at the Mauritius Research Council as manager for, for research prior to that. Dr. Garib Fakim earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Surrey, and then a PhD from the University of Ex Exeter later. As a founding member of the Pan-African Association of African Medicinal Plants, she co-authored the first ever African herbal <laughs> pharmacopoeia, sorry. She has authored and co-edited 30 books, several book chapters and scientific articles in the field of biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable development. Dr. Gurib Fakim has been the recipient of several awards in all spheres of her professional and civic engagement over decades. She's been elevated to the order of the commander of the star and key by the government of Mauritius in 2008. She's been admitted to the order of the Chevalier dans l'Ordre de Palme Académique by the government of France in 2010 and is the recipient of six honorary doctorates of science. Most recently in 2019, she received the Trailblazing Award for Political Leadership by the Women Leaders Council in Iceland. And in 2021, she received the Benazir Bhutto Lifetime Achievement Award, the Obada Prize for, from Egypt, and the Roof Forum Recognition Prize. Dr. Garib Fakim, welcome. My second guest, Honorable Minister Paula Ingaberi, is a Rwandan technology enthusiast who currently serves as the Minister of ICT and Innovation in the Government of Rwanda. Prior to her appointment as minister, she served as head of the ICT Business Development Department of the Rwanda Development Board, where she led the implementation of national ICT programs, as well as coordinated the Kigali Innovation City Project, a flagship program of the government designed to nurture and strengthen a Pan-African innovation ecosystem in Rwanda. Minister Ngabiri coordinated the creation of Smart Africa, an initiative that seeks to leverage broadband infrastructure as a driver of Africa's socioeconomic growth. A graduate of Massachusetts Institute of Technology's School of Engineering and Sloan School of Management in the System Design and Management Program, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering and Information Technology from the University of Rwanda. Minister Paula was named in 2019 by Apolitical among the top 20 of the world's 100 most influential people in digital government. She serves on the Global Council of the World Summit Award Board of Directors, World Economic Forum Cybersecurity Board, the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Global Network Advisory Board, and the World Economic Forum Board of Trustees. Minister Paula, welcome. Last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Christelle Kizera, who is a mechanical engineer and social entrepreneur. She's involved in initiatives around water scarcity, environmental and youth issues. She's keen on finding and growing triple bottom line business models. I hope she can tell us about that, that can solve the world's wickedest problems profitably while delivering a positive impact on people and the planet. 
In 2014, while still in university, she founded Water Access Rwanda to address issues of water scarcity and youth employment in Rwanda. A year later, she graduated magna cum laude from Oklahoma Christian University with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Under Christelle's management, Water Access Rwanda has become a powerhouse that delivers safe tap water to everyone, everywhere. To do that, it builds water mini grids on top of previously defunct boreholes and installs rain to tap water systems. It offers financing to individuals and communities that to facilitate access to water sources and then provides maintenance and quality monitoring to keep the taps running. Water Access Rwanda has pumped more than 111 million liters of clean water and has financed 353 households to facilitate access to piped water in their homes. Over 100,000 people have been served with clean water through Water Access Rwanda. Households experienced 58% savings on their water bills, and users who would traditionally fetch water manually save 53 minutes from each of their water trips. Christelle has been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, too many to count, heralding her good work. On June 21st of this year, she was presented with Her Majesty the Queen's Points of Light Award for having founded Water Access Rwanda. Christelle, welcome to you. Can anyone hear Roland? No, Roland, you are muted. Oh, so sorry. I muted myself so that I wouldn't cough and then you couldn't hear me. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Dr. Green Fakim, you've achieved so much, born in a small village, to president, the first female president of Mauritius. Take us through your journey and career trajectory. What were some of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? Thank you, uh, Roland. Um, thank you for associating me with this very important event. I must make a small adjustment or ad addition when you were introducing me. You didn't mention that I'm also a mother. <laughs> so uh, if I were to define my journey, which as you have rightly said, start in a small village in Mauritius, if I were to think at the time whether I will end up one day in the state house of my country, I would say this was, of course, uh, a nightmare, or rather a beautiful dream, unachievable, unattainable because of my background. So if I were to sum up my journey, I would sum it up in three words, or three Ds, as I call them, to dream, to dare, and to do. So these are my three dreams, my three Ds. But let's begin with the dream part. I was growing up in a village where there was nothing in terms of infrastructure because we're still thinking about uh, colonial Mauritius because I was growing up at a time when I had to sing uh, God, God Save the Queen every day. I used to come home and say to my father, who is this queen we sing to every day? Anyway, so I grew up in that village. There was nothing. There was only one institution which made a difference, and that was my school. So I was, I had, I went to primary school and then the choice came for secondary education because this is again something that matters on the continent or elsewhere in the developing global south is that education was not free. But my father made the point to actually send me to secondary school because he felt that he had to give the best opportunity to his children, both his boy and his girl. So if I were to sum this again, the, the, the lesson I can draw from this is that you need to have a good cheerleader. And my cheerleader was my father. So we need to get these cheerleaders, especially the fathers, the uncle, the grandfathers, the brother, everybody there has to actually be there for the girl. So, and the other thing is that I went to a convent school 
and I'm Muslim by, by you know, religion. And uh, my father chose the best scholastic education his daughter could have. And of course, the best at the time was the convent education. So I was taught by these great nuns from Ireland. And uh, so again, this is something that we have to put in the discussion is that there was no incongruity whatsoever uh, to be sent to a, to a different school, but beyond your faith. Because in these days, you know, the faith has become a very key issue in many, on many, on many front, be it political, you know, social or whatever. So I grew up in this, in this village, what I called the microcosm of the world. And at school, at the secondary school rather, I was infected by the virus of science because I had wonderful teachers who were able to actually demystify science for me. These teachers were able to answer my questions, which an inquisitive 11 year was forever having. Why is the sky blue? You know, why is the sea blue? And only when you hold the water, it's not blue. And, uh, you know, what are you doing when you're actually cooking uh, an egg, for example? I was told that I was doing science then. So that was my journey into the science. So there was no infrastructure in the school. So I would be taken to this river and to the sea or to the forest. And this is where I would learn science. I could pick up a leaf, I could pick up a flower and smell it, and I was carried into the wonders of science. But there were two events which actually marked my journey as well. And we talk about role modeling, we talk about events. One of the first event was men walking on the moon. I saw that live in my, in my, in my, in my village. And I was saying to myself, wow, I mean, this is science, it's transformative. The second part, which of course was all, that was that really shaped my, my, my journey, was with the birth of baby Brown, the, the test tube baby. Again, I thought, wow. I mean, this was this was science. It was wow, it was wonderful. Then, you know, as uh, all, all girls and all students have go undergo that journey, they go to see the careers guidance officer. We are talking 1979. I went to see this career guidance officer. And he saw this waif-like girl walking to the door and says to, he says to me, uh, what are you going to, why do you come to see me? I say, I want to get some uh, advice because I'm passionate about chemistry and I want to, to do that. He said to me, girl, science is not for you. It's not for, for girls, this is for boys. You should be doing something like, you know, other areas like home economics, I remember him mentioning, or do cooking and things like this. And I said, okay. So he said to me, I hope I have given you the advice. I said, yes, thank you very much. I went home. I said to my father, he, this is what he said. So he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to use chemistry because this is where my heart lies. And this is what, it, what I'm passionate about. He said to me, are you sure? Because he said to you also, when you come back, there'll be no job for you. I said, okay, we'll take the risk. So that was the first risk I took. Go and follow your heart. Be passionate about what you do. And if you listen to what Confucius has said, I thought I said it, but then I learned Confucius has said this before me. If you are passionate about what you do in your life, you will not have to work a single day in your life. So that was my journey. So I went to university. I chose the university that was doing industrial training because even then I realized if you get exposure to the world of science, the real world of science, that could also be transformative. So I went there. And mind you, this is something I also like to say, we are living in the era of technology where people not take for granted that uh, you'll communicate with your parents and uh, you know, you, you'll be there forever in touch with them. There was no such thing. There was no phone in my village, in my house as well. So we had to wait for the letters to come every two weeks to know how the parents are doing. So I put my head, got my head down, worked, spent one year in industry, came back to Mauritius for a holiday. Then I got a, a, a scholarship and went to do a PhD at the University of Exeter. Still not knowing what to do. After my PhD, I got a postdoc and I was ready to go just like many people do to the United States to do a postdoc. I came home and I said, I will now stay home because my parents wanted me to be there. So I took up this position in the university, but I must say that when I went to university, my heart sank because the infrastructure I was used to wasn't there. So what do you do? Second risk, I was still passionate about science. I went into the world of plants because we are in a biodiversity hotspot. The chance of getting new molecules were there. I could publish, add to the body of literature. So there I was going on the world of science uh, through plants. 
Second risk is that I was forever being told that my work was low level because I'm an organic chemist by training. I could not possibly be getting results working with weeds. So second risk, I persevered and I published the very first database on herbal knowledge. Again, adding novelty to Africa where transmission is oral and this is where, where we lose a lot. Then I made uh, history in my institution. I became the first woman professor in this area. And I translated my research into an enterprise eventually, but first I translated it into validation of my knowledge. Then I became Dean, as you have rightly said, my introduction, Deputy Vice Chancellor. Then I didn't get the post of Vice Chancellor, so I left. I translated my research into a business and I created my very first enterprise. First, because I carried my data across the Valley of Death into a business, which again was a third risk I took. There was another risk I took as well, I didn't mention, is the risk of getting married. You know, that's also a big risk because if you marry somebody who is not going to be supportive, all this journey tantamounts to nothing because you have somebody who will be forever watching over your shoulder. What are you doing? Are you advancing further than I am? So that becomes an issue. So first, fourth risk I took was when I actually translated my research into a business. I was very happily minding my own business when one day in 2014, a journalist called me and says, ma'am, your name has been cited for presidency. Are you going to run? I said, you know, I think you've got the wrong person. I have no ambitions in politics, but if you say so, you know, we'll see. The next day in the newspaper, there's my picture, Amina Guri fucking for president, small interrogation mark. People don't see the interrogation mark. And there I was on the roll. But it was a David against Goliath match because I knew the other party was stronger, but my name was flagged. So I said, why not? Fifth risk. And uh, then one day in December, I was uh, looking at the, you know, the, the, the election actually be the result. And uh, after they, they have counted everything, I closed my laptop and I said, I'm going to be president. So that was my journey. <laughs> So there was, there was, as I said, the, the few message I can actually bring to the table here, be passionate, enjoy what you're doing, take risk, calculated risk, maybe this is something that uh, is not taught in any business school. And uh, the other thing as well is to just create your own path. Nothing will be given. Everything will be taken away from you. That's for sure. Get that rhino skin on early on and just stay focused and just stay focused and never give up hard work. Because one thing as well, you must know that hard work and the excellence, excellence mainly, excellence knows no gender. So if you want to get out there and give your best and get the best, you will have to give the hours, you have to sacrifice, you have to make. And uh, you know, just know as well that if you're a woman, there'll be no happy hour for you because uh, you'll be there at home looking after the children. You can fight patriarchy, but uh, it's a bit complicated for the time being. So learn to spend your hours judiciously. But one thing I will say before I close is that us women, and here I speak as, a, as one woman in a community of women, let us learn to support each other. Let us be that woman we can turn to and seek help. Why I'm saying this, because I'm going to end by citing Madeleine Albright when she said, there's a special place in hell for those women who do not help women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. I mean, fascinating, fascinating career trajectory. Um, and as you can see, the, the ladies who are connected here, we are already, we're not going to help because we are already women helping women, helping women, helping girls. Um, you made a couple of really excellent points. Um, I forgot to mention that you were a mother. I forgot to mention that you were also an entrepreneur. This is very important. And you focused a lot on taking risk. So I want now perhaps to turn to the Honorable Minister and to say, you know, Minister Paula, what made you choose computer science and IT? Is that what you always wanted to do? Did you think about this as risk-taking, walking on the wild side? Tell us a little bit about what you chose for our studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. And, and perhaps I should echo Dr. Amin and, and also remind you that I'm a mother, a mother of three. <laughs> 
But um, very straight to the question, uh, and I enjoyed listening to Dr. Amin. I, I think I saw so many similarities um, in, in a bit of the story, and, and, and these similarities are really uh, around you know, the people that did uh, encourage me uh, to pursue STEM um, you know, education and eventually you know, a career. And when, when I look back, and I think as I reflected on your question uh, for today's session, uh, I realized whether it was from my father and, and, and the choice of mentors that I've met along the way, most of them were male. And, and this may not be a story that is similar for everyone, but I think I, I was um, you know, blessed to have been surrounded by people who believed in, um, in the potential for women uh, to really venture or girls to venture into STEM areas. And so mine also really starts with my dad, who is a mechanical engineer by background. And so being a mechanical engineer, I, I, I come from a family of six uh, children and the second. My dad did something very interesting where every time it was holiday time or weekends, he made sure each one of us was doing a certain set of math uh, problems, solving them. And so, and, and obviously, as you can imagine, we, we all, and, and as girls uh, and the relationship with our dad, we always wanted, all of us were really racing to see who would do the more questions, but also who would get them correct. And so I think starting from a very early age and just really pushing for us to, to love math and, and, and solve a lot of math problems. We didn't have holiday times. It was always about during holidays. I remember sometimes it was solving for about 50 to 100 problems, of course, based on you know what year you're in. And so I think that naturally, uh, made it easy, uh, one, for me to love math, physics, but also to venture into, uh, uh, you know, STEM fields. And then uh, going forward, what also happened was, I remember as I was finishing a secondary school and I was getting in and, and I was trying to decide what do I need to do. Uh, I met someone, at, at then he was a minister of education and we were looking at different options. I was considering scholarships, like most, uh, when you're done with, with the secondary school, what you're trying to do. And so he says, I'll only help you if you're thinking about doing computer science. And I said, why not? <laughs> so that for me was already like, you know, straightforward. I have to go for this. And that's how I ended up um, in a computer science, uh, you know, uh, you know, bachelor's degree. But what was also interesting was getting into that space and realizing how few, and, and better if I take a step back in secondary school, I, I went with the option of math, physics and chemistry. And while I did not realize at that point in time that indeed were fewer girls then, I think it was also just helpful to find, you know, more young girls, age mates who were really keen and, and, and very excited about math and also really, uh, you know, ambitious in the sense that we we're always trying to, to beat the boys and get the best grades in, in, in these subjects. And so I get into um, university at the University of Rwanda, then it was Kist, and still we had fewer uh, women or girls uh, that, that were doing uh, computer science and other engineering fields. Uh, but what was also interesting, I guess it was also an emerging field and, you know, there was all the curiosity. I always tell people that if you want to get me to do something, try and doubt that I won't be able to do. Try and challenge me. And I feel like that's where I derive my energy to be able to say, you dare me, you think I cannot do it. I'm going to go all out to try and do that. So I always feel like every time, uh, you know, someone tries to seem like they're not so sure I'll get it done. It, it, that's why I get all my energy and resolve to say, I, I'm going to prove you wrong. I, I need to prove everyone wrong. Um, but I also believe in this journey, whether it's education and career, you need to be your greatest advocate. It starts with you, because regardless of mentors and people around you who are trying to push you and encourage you, who believe in you, if it doesn't start with you, then I think it has limits. Uh, because sometimes the kind of advice that you're going to receive at the end of the day, uh, it's going to boil down to you as an individual making the decision. Why do I say this? Um, so remember that I started on my career. Uh, I had some of the best um, you know, supervisors and bosses. And so along the journey, I remember while it was really tough and I was trying to figure out how do I move ahead. So one of the, my mentors who I really looked up to who was, he was male, he says, because I, I had a natural ability to organizing events and getting things done. It's something I would do even in my sleep and sort of figure out what are the natural next steps to get this done. And, and so he had realized that. And so when I was struggling with where I had pivoted to with my career, I remember he gave me advice and he says, you know what, maybe if this is not working, you should consider, you know, just venturing into event management. I remember going home and thinking, so I did a whole degree to eventually end up in events management. And I was very disappointed because I was like, this is someone I've looked up to as a mentor. For them to say this, what does it mean? And, and that brings me back to why I say 
it, it felt like they were daring me. It, it felt like they were telling me, this is as far as you can go in your career. And I, and I, and I was so mad at this person that I even, you know, considered not even having them to continue to be my mentor, but I had, I was like, I need to sit them down and tell them I, I didn't really appreciate this advice. Of course, seeing where they were coming from, they felt like at that point in time, I was in a very um, uh, you know, tough situation where they felt like even if they tried to push me forward, I, they, I think they felt for themselves that I wasn't going to move forward and they were trying to get an alternative uh, pathway. So I remember just saying, I didn't appreciate that you would think I would go into event management. You could have, you know, you need to figure out, you need to know that this is where my passion is. This is what I'm really interested in. So when you give me this kind of advice, I, I just feel like you have limited what I can potentially get to. And so, that in itself, again, beyond the people who were supporting for me, it was the doubters that really gave me the energy to say, I can do this. It is very possible. And so here I am and I'm, and I'm enjoying and loving you know, this field. Every day I wake up to work on a problem, to work with the teams. I feel like there's growth. And, 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 and I feel like the best that we can do is really give back to many of the young girls out there and sort of support them in their choices that they're making going forward. Thank you so much, Minister Paula. I, it's good to know that you are motivated by the doubters. You know, Christelle, maybe over to you. you I see you nodding your head. Um, I'm curious about what sparked your interest in engineering. Um, were you encouraged to pursue this passion? Uh, did you have, you know, mentors along the way? Uh, please share with us what it is that motivated you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm so privileged to be here with women I look up to. Dr. Mina, Paula, um, you already inspire me. So I'm glad to be on a panel inspiring other women together with you. Um, growing up, I would say um, I'm not that um, old yet. So I grew up in, uh, you know, the 2000s. That's when I was going to primary school. So there was already quite a shift in society on what women were capable of. So I don't think I struggle to find role models or struggle to find support at home for doing tough things or things that would have been perceived by others um, as things for men only. Um, so actually at home, I was I grew up in a very supportive environment um, and we love science fiction, especially from my dad. So we watched a lot of Star Trek. Uh, we watched a lot of uh, MacGyver, which are all shows about people exploring, you know, being genius with their science, with the engineering, being able to figure out how to get out of any situation. Because when you know how materials work, when you can come up with your own tools, you can find your way out of anything. And I guess as a kid, I was obsessed with that being resourceful. I wanted to be resourceful in any situation. And I knew very early on that I wanted to be some type of engineer, some type of person who can invent and figure out how to do things from what is available. Um, and that's what my career has become. And actually even my little sister is a mechanical engineer. I ended up doing mechanical engineering. So something at home uh, kind of inspired us along this path. Um, and when I went to school, I was at first at Lise Notre Dame de Cito. So it was an all girls school. Uh, we were there, again, competing with the boys from a school level perspective. So it was always about being better than the boys going to the seminary or those going to the mixed schools. Um, and there was quite a lot of pride because I saw many girls graduate ahead of me who would go on to you know, study master, uh, to do um, their bachelors in tough fields. Um, and I always knew that was an option for me. So early on, I had started developing some entrepreneurship um, tendencies or you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, already as a kid. So I kind of knew there is, you know, the science and then the entrepreneurship. It wasn't until later when I figured they were uh, really quite well connected and that the skills I was learning um, as a science woman, I love math a lot. And if you say I'm a problem solver, if you tell me I'm good at um, analytical thinking or critical thinking, I can draw it down to all those math problems. Uh, that I solved. So as uh, Minister Paula talks about solving problems during vacation, I am like, I did that for fun too. <laughs> I would, you know, sometimes when I'm feeling down or stressed, you know, I just grab my calculus book and try to solve some tough problems. And that usually cheers me up. So growing up, I would say until I finished secondary, I never felt like a minority. 
I never felt like being a woman doing science, loving math and physics was anything special or out of the ordinary. But that quickly changed uh, when I enrolled in my mechanical engineering degree. Actually, my first day of class, that's when I looked around and I noticed we're in a class of 53 people and there was only four women uh, with me. And uh, the year ended with only two of us women left. Actually, it was only me, but one ended up returning to the program, but the others dropped out. And that's when I really started to feel like a minority. And the, the type of professor I had for a class made all the difference. We only had male professors. I didn't get to be taught by a woman except for math. So we would go to, you know, there was the engineering department and then there was the art and um, um, the, the arts department. We would go to do our math classes and then we do some of the other engineering courses in the engineering department. So there was no woman teaching us uh, what I would say hardcore engineering classes. Um, so I kind of didn't find a lot of role models um, when I was um, at school. But um, some of the professors made a big effort. Um, the kind of student who uses uh, professors uh, hours like I don't really love lectures so I learn in conversation so some professors loved that and encouraged and taught me through that and I had one particular professor who I think he was still wondering what a girl is doing in his class and every time I would go to his open hours and I you know sit down and you know I'm trying to figure out something and then he'll be say something like it's okay sweetie you don't need to worry about that and it was, that was very condescending. It's like, why don't I have to worry about this? This is a subject I'm learning. I want to know, I want to do this very well. Um, so there were moments like that that were quite discouraging where I was reminded, I'm not just a brain trying to get this and do this. I'm a woman brain. Um, and that would be brought to my attention sometimes. Uh, but I actually had professors that would point out quite in a very positive way why me being a woman and thinking like a woman made me much better at certain subjects. I remember, for example, my thermodynamics class, I was getting 98% when the second grade in the class was like a 70%. Everybody hated me because that would mean the curve would be bad, like everybody would end up not getting uh, curved up. So things like that, like the way we think as women, it can actually help us be better at sciences uh, than a big class um, of male counterparts. So. I would say that I was encouraged until I was in university. Um, and throughout my university career, I also had to struggle with uh, people not wanting to see me as just an engineer doing engineering stuff, but as a woman doing engineering stuff. And that constant labeling and bringing me uh, down to that was something I, I really struggled with um, and found purpose in it when I started inspiring other women. Because unlike how I grew up in the environment I grew up in, I quickly noted that a lot of girls were coming from backgrounds where they were plain discouraged uh, from pursuing the science careers and engineering careers they wanted to pursue. So being able to, sh uh, to share that I'm not just a woman doing, uh, a person doing engineering, I'm a woman doing engineering, I found purpose in inspiring other uh, women who were um, uh, struggling or not getting the support they needed. Um, so I was encouraged. I think the fact that I got a science background and engineering background was key to starting my business, to being a problem solver. Um, that's what I wanted to be when I was growing up. And that's what I am today. I solve problems, tough problems. Um, and you asked me to explain what a triple bottom line is, but that is when you pursue a business that is not just interested in generating financial profits, but a business that impacts the planet and people positively. So a lot of our products are water access to Rwanda are having a positive impact on the planet, on people, and at the same time generating us profit as a business. And I've always wanted to be a problem solver, to be resourceful with the little I have. And uh, those skills that I learned uh, throughout my engineering degree and my earlier uh, science classes really play out on my day to day. Thank you so much, Christelle. Amazing. Um, you know, and one of the things that struck me is that this conversation also sort of has 
three different generations of people, right? I mean, Dr. Amina speaks a little bit about what she felt in 1979. You're saying you grew up in the 2000s, and of course, Paula somewhere in between. Um, the the I, and I think it does make a difference in terms of how the STEM field can is is seen. Yeah, I had a lot more questions, but as you've seen, there are lots of questions in the Q and A, and so maybe we can turn to that. And maybe here we tried to keep the answers very short so that we can go through a few. There are a number of questions around how do you know you've chosen the right career, right? How do you know you're in the right place? I think um, Minister Paula, when she spoke, said, you know, somebody halfway through her journey said, you know, maybe you should do an event management. She's like, no, I, that doesn't feel right for me. Um, Dr. Amena, how would you respond to that? How do you knew, how did you know that chemistry was, was you being in the right place? Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. The, you know, the thing is that I'd never had a career path. I was just enjoying what I was doing and I was passionate about science. So that, that was all I was doing. I, and uh, to me, the best advice I can ever give to any young person is just enjoy what you're doing. Because if you want to give good work, if you want to actually deliver on good work, you have to enjoy what you're doing. And that's what I did. No career path, just follow your heart and do whatever you do, do the best and give your best. Throughout Fantastic. Paula, Paula, would you agree? Yes, I would agree and I would also add that, um, and, and I know it's a very thin line between what excites you and what's so easy for you to do. And, and for some people, they're lucky if what excites them, what they're passionate about is also easy to do. But for others, you have to be very careful to make a clear distinction between are these things that are so easy for me to do, but I won't wake up every morning excited to do them because you know I, I don't feel challenged enough. And then you have the bucket of things where you're saying, okay, I may not know a lot about this, but I feel like I, I will constantly be learning and, and I, I guess, again it comes back to your personality so for me it has always been what is that thing that I wake up and I always feel like I'm constantly challenged not that it's easy to do but something that I feel I'm constantly challenged on and I feel like I'm learning and growing that's wonderful I think Christelle there's a very specific question to you around imposter syndrome I'm not sure whether or not that's something that you suffer from but you know the idea of I'm showing up here this is the role that I have but it doesn't fit exactly well on me and it kind of is the other side of the question on you know why did you choose the thing that you choose how would you comment on that is that something that you suffer from Yes, um, well, that's actually something I suffer from and talk about a lot. And even with my team, it's something we're always talking about. And it's a, something that a lot of very powerful and knowledgeable women do suffer from because you're, you have this constant feeling that maybe you're not what everybody sees or says you are. Um, and it, it's built over years, especially, um, I think for me, it came from the fact that I felt like um, I was getting a lot of positive feedback on my work. Um, and um, I felt like the bar was set lower because I was a woman and I wanted it to be high. There was always some critique I had about my work and I wasn't getting that from people. People were easy to clap for little achievement that I made when I wanted to hold myself at a higher standard. So over the years, then it developed into a whole imposter syndrome where I'm like, Am I getting recognized because I'm that good or because I'm a woman who's that good? Um, and now with the, where science becomes very helpful with the imposter syndrome is numbers don't lie, right? One is one, two is two, 50 is 50, 100 is 100. So I can go on screaming about how, my com how great my company is or things like that or wondering maybe it's not that good, like how well am I doing? But if, if I open a book and I'm reviewing um, similar companies and how they're performing, I'm looking at their revenue numbers, their profit numbers, that's very easy to compare myself to without being very um, subjective and having all that feelings into it. And actually that can feed back now to give myself a fair evaluation of what's happening. Um, and when we talk about that, usually imposter syndrome, Make, um, is trying to make yourself uh, make yourself smaller. Um, you're trying to make yourself smaller than you actually are. Um, usually, when um, it strikes, or you know, you're suffering from it. Uh, so, being able to have the numbers to measure your work into clear, tangible outputs 
that anybody looking at it will recognize those numbers. Uh, that is a really good way to fight imposter syndrome and keep yourself accountable to your actual output. So that's something I do. If you ever walk into my company or ask any of my staff, we all know what our numbers are. We know which numbers inform on how good or how bad our work is going. And we care a lot about data, which uh, again, that's also a big source of innovation for us because we're able to see you know, where we can make quick wins and uh, longer term wins uh, if we were to improve something. So imposter syndrome, it's definitely something that um, I hope the, um, the ladies watching um, and hearing us talk realize is real. Um, you, some of the women we look up to like our biggest role models. Um, I was surprised when um, my role model told me she has imposter syndrome because I was like, with everything about you, how can you have imposter syndrome? And she asked me the same thing. And um, even I hope the women um, who are following remember that um, it's an imposter. It is not the truth. It's an imposter. So know your numbers. Judge yourself fairly. Don't let the imposter win. You are where you are and you deserve all the recognitions you're getting. Christelle, thank you so much. I think another theme that I'm seeing through a lot of the questions is, you know, balancing work and, you know, motherhood. Both um, Dr. Amina and Minister Paula mentioned proudly, of course, that they are mothers. And I think that there is a lot of conversation about, you know, STEM careers being difficult, you having to dedicate a lot of your time, and that this might be counterintuitive or, you know, goes against having, you know, being a, a, a nurturer, being a parent, etc. So a lot of the questions are about how about balancing um, work and life and this important aspect of life. And I know that this is a concern for many young girls in choosing careers. What say the two of you? Minister Paula, you might want to start. Thank you, Roland. And, and, and I must start by saying uh, what is important is that sometimes when we talk about balance, I think it's easier said than done. And I always feel like every time I want to try and balance everything in my life, things just don't work out the way I had planned. So you need to be comfortable with that. But I think it's also uh, making this, the, where the balance comes in is really deciding how much time are you giving to your career versus your family, because those things are complementary, but also not forgetting yourself. I always say, even while we're trying to balance, whether it's your career and family, think about yourself as an individual and have what we call me time um, and, and figure out when it's best to have that. So for me, as a mother of three very young kids, my oldest is nine, uh, my youngest is five, you can imagine uh, what that means um, on a daily basis, but also knowing that there are certain times that I have to care about and regardless of how urgent things might, may, may have to be, then that time it, it, they know is dedicated for them. And I think that certainty is very important when you have a very young family for them to know that these are th this particular day we have her full time. And if, if anything has to come in between you having that time, communicate it ahead of time, but also make up for it. And so I feel like that has been uh, so Super helpful and I feel like we're also dealing with a generation that knows what they want um, and, and my kids sometimes will call me out and say you know uh, mommy the other day my, my, my youngest two's five say you know can you tell the people you're going to meet that you have two daughters that, that have a performance at school and you have to be there and I looked at her and I imagined how it was going to be difficult for me to do that what saved me was that the events the work event and the school event did collide in time but I think that also they, they keep me honest about what uh, I, I must do and the time that I must give them. But um, just to come back to your question, I think what is also very helpful, I think it, it gives you the ability to appreciate uh, and also to be sensitive to the needs of the other working mothers around you. And, and today we are talking about a world where in every corporate organization, we are coming up with all these uh, child, early childhood development centers within the workplace to give uh, you know, young mothers the ability and, 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 and the ability to feel comfortable being at work, but also having their kids within close proximity that they can check on them. But, it, but I think also in, in, in the technology world that we are in, in the digital world that we're in, where now we have all these remote working tools that we can put to the disposal of everyone so that they 
can be able to, you know, balance whether it's their, you know, the family needs and professional uh, responsibilities easily, then we must be the very first champions in, in providing those tools, but also enabling an environment where, um, you know, these people can, can be able to contribute effectively and efficiently to the workplace, but at the same time, uh, you know, be there uh, as mothers um, or as parents or guardians, whatever they may be. Thank you, Minister Paula. Dr. Amina, do you have a similar view? Uh, yes, but uh, I will start with the cliche. You know, society still expects uh, parenthood to be 90% the woman's contribution. And uh, uh, the cliche will go that if a man comes to work, uh, keep, comes home late, they will say the society and the, the family will say the father is working very hard for the family. But if the mother comes in uh, after, in a, late in the evening, a few days a week, I mean, that woman is not serious. I mean, she's spending too much time on her career, on her self-advancement, and she's not paying enough attention to the children. So that's the cliche. Also, the happy hour in many society is frowned upon because this is where networking is, is happening for, for many people with careers. So again, the woman has to sacrifice. How do I meander through all this is that I had a few priorities. Uh, I said to myself that I want a family and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of my children and I'm very happy to have them. I, I want to have a career because this is what uh, you know I decided a very long time ago when I was a child. But, you know, in 24 hours, there's only so much you can do. Um, so I, I said that I will, uh, well, I will not sacrifice a social life, but I will build my social life around my family, around my children and around the workplace. So there are choices to be made. But one thing is that, you know, you, will, you cannot fight patriarchy. Uh, you, it will take a long time uh, for our countries to adopt policies like in sex kind of countries where paternity leave, of course, is, 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 is approved and it's uh, not frowned upon. Uh, so this is uh, the journey that we'll have to go through there. But I was always uh, organizing myself when I travel. I used to prepare the meals and leave it in the freezer, organize the uniforms, you know, all these things. Of course, one thing I, I'm beholden to is that I would not have been able to, to do it if I didn't have house help and also if I didn't have the support of my parents. Because whenever I was traveling, my mother stepped in and she was always there, you know, behind me all along. And uh, so I had very had lot, lots of support. Again, I had a husband who did not mind because they can really put the spanner if you are traveling too much, doing too many things. But also the advice I have for girls, marry somebody who is happy doing what he's doing, then he will leave you alone. Very interesting. Um, and I see some, some commonalities there. When you said you had a husband who was supportive, Minister Paula shook her head. Um, when you talked about priorities, Minister Paula said pretty much the same thing, you know, that you kind of have to figure out what, how do you, the, there's no such thing as like fully balanced. So the question is being totally focused when you are in that space and ensuring that you carve out time for the other thing. And I think all of this is really, really exceptional advice. Um, you know, Chriselle, you, you, we have some excellent questions coming in on the chat. And really, I'm looking at the time and wondering whether we're gonna get a chance to get to all of them. I think one of the first things I'd like to mention is that we have a hundred and we had up to 126 people connected and I'm seeing questions and comments from persons from South Sudan as well as Sudan, which means that we're reaching past Rwanda, which is really amazing. And this is the beauty of digital and technology. I have a really interesting question here and Christelle, I'm gonna put this to you first um, from somebody who's asking, how can men, I guess I would add, and boys be better allies for women and girls in STEM? Do you have any good stories or examples that you can share with us? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think the very first thing is how you collaborate and what kind of team worker you are. Um, I still remember in college going from the person that everybody frowns if I'm on their team to like now being the team people want to be on uh, from my classmates. Um, so, I mean, I could have done with that the initial discomfort of feeling like nobody wants me on my team. Uh, but the fact that uh, my male colleagues were able to realize um, how good I was and embrace that, um, that was critical. I've seen some very toxic 
um, uh, words going around from um, uh, men who believe that if a woman is doing, doing good or being recognized, oh, it's only because the standard is lower because she's a woman. And unfortunately, that doesn't play out in science. It might um, in, uh, in athletes or things where we have different um, abilities, but um, with science and the things we do, we tend to really have the same um, uh, starting start. So when somebody's doing good, it doesn't matter if they're men or women, if they make an invention, they're gonna win, let's say the Nobel Prize, they didn't get it handed to them because they're just a woman. Um, and so that kind of talk is very toxic and being the kind of guy who says, no, she's actually good, uh, being able to stand for what is true, even when you know, there's kind of a men talk happening um, is very critical. The other thing is um, at this point, it's inevitable that a lot of men uh, will end up working for or with um, a woman uh, who is in the STEM field. Um, so don't be bad about that. Uh, don't resent that. Don't become somebody who's like, oh, I can't respect a woman or something, or consistently judge this person through the lens of them being a woman and not um, them being the capable, knowledgeable people that are, are in the position uh, you're collaborating with. So I think those are some on the collaboration side, uh, but um, it really starts in the home. Um, I grew up with an amazing brother who even works with me now in my company. And growing up, I never felt like he was a guy and I was a girl. He involved me in everything that he was up to. He's an older brother. Uh, whatever interests I kicked on, he would be supportive and come along. Uh, we even used to joke, like, for example, I'm really bad at, like, cooking rice, but I'm really good at fixing a salad. Um, and he has, like, this favorite dish that he loves to cook, and I have my favorite dish. So whenever it's time to, like, get cooking, um, it was never about, like, oh, you're the girl, go do that. It was always like, oh, yeah, we both know how to cook these two dishes, let's go do it. Um, so something like that, and this was really reinforced by my parents. Um, so we grew up in that mood and that household where not only did I have my brother who uh, we were almost the same age, he's two years older. So we were kind of always uh, compared, uh, but we never took that in any sense of like um, he's male and female um, or anything like that. He was a really great brother. And even today we work together and he supports me a lot um, in the company. So I would say that recognize your role um, as uh, somebody that society tends to attribute a lot to and usually encourages quite toxic behavior from men. So be the person who breaks the chain. Um, if you are part of a chain where uh, they put women down, break it, right? I use all this knowledge um, as a boy, as a man that is out there, that is available, find those role models uh, get inspired by what's going on in the world and have the courage to break uh, any bad chain of toxic behavior that you might, you know, be pulled to be a part of. Um, so that would be my advice. Um, and um, I can't really discount the role that men in our lives have on our ability Absolutely. to face a world that is still very much um, machovinistic. Uh, in many ways. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Crystal. I know that the person who asked, because I see the name, I think I recognize it, is a dad, right? We heard from Dr. Amena how much she was inspired by her father. Um, I think your, the point that you made, Crystal, as well on collaboration. So maybe when you're not the parent, but you are a coworker or a teammate or a peer at school, drawing that colleague in, even when she's a woman, very, very important, right? Creating a space for her, not setting a lower standard or a different standard, treating her as an equal. These are all important elements. And sometimes when you see that person perhaps not being treated as an equal, creating that space by pushing back against other colleagues who are not you know, looking at that individual and saying, she's bringing as much to the table as I am or we are, and sometimes more. I think I see another set of questions. There are many. I know we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but there is there are a number of questions here around um, parents, convincing parents, 
um, to be able to take on STEM careers being one piece. And then another obstacle, which is resources. There's one question here specifically that says, you know, you pursue science um, from one of our top academies, Gashora Girls um, mentioned here, a number of persons connected from Fawe, Rusumo High School um, also being mentioned, but one specific, uh, this question comes from someone from Rusumo High School, um, says, we study science, great. We finish secondary school and you don't get a scholarship. And there people look at you and say, you know, you've done nothing. You've spent all this time. You're not going ahead. Whereas if you study TVET, right, very soon after your work, you can get a job, right? So, in, you know, if you go to vocational school, it sets you up for a job. And if you go and you're an academic, it's a harder path because to go to the next level, you need a scholarship. You're going to need more money. What would we say about that around resources, right? We all come from different backgrounds. I think Dr. Amina, I'd really like to hear from you on this, having said that you've come from, you know, means that were maybe modest at the beginning. What is your view? And you're at a university now. How do we get our way in when so, you know, when we're not, when our families are, are poor, are from modest means? Mute, please, off mute. Yeah, first of all, I'll quickly react to what Crystal has said uh, in terms of parenting. And I think I was lucky to have had a father who would tell me that I was capable of doing anything. And this is something that you have to keep on telling that girl from a very young age, that she's capable of doing anything because it's only when she had the self-confidence that she will then be able to take risk further down her life. And this is exactly what I did. So being told all the time that you are capable of so you can do anything. Now to come back to the issue of resources, um, you know, when I came to university, I was confronted, I mean, university in Mauritius, I was confronted with exactly the same thing. Uh, I came in with great expectations and thinking that, you know, uh, we will do research exactly as I was doing in the UK, but I quickly realized that this was not going to be the case. Then what do I do? Do I give up and say, okay, because the red carpet wasn't rolled out to me, uh, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. I will leave and I will go elsewhere. Instead, I chose to build. I chose to work with the existing uh, knowledge, with the existing infrastructure and build that infrastructure. And this is when I would knock on the doors of donors and I said, look, this is, of course, at the personal level, because I'm going to talk also about the country level and at the institutional level. So at the level, at the personal level, I would, not, I would knock on the doors of donors, I managed to get grants, and I gradually build the infrastructure. So one thing that you have to know that and not the red carpet will not be rolled out just because you come in with university degree or whatever. The second thing that in, this is where I think Africa and this is where I think country like Rwanda has an exceeding well. This is also my country had started at some point, And this is why it reflects on the indicators of the country is that the country must invest in her people. This is something that nobody will do for you. This is something that we had said to ourselves immediately after independence, that someone will come and invest in our, in our, system, in our, in our children. It is not the case. We have to dip in our own pocket and invest. So we need that budget. And this is where initially in my own country, education became free for all. So that made a difference when education became accessible to one and all. The second thing that I will also uh, 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 you know, kind of bring to the table, and this is something where Africa will make a big difference if we do that, if we invest in the ecosystem that will help that bright child with an idea to actually jump, become an entrepreneur, because Africa will need uh, the 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 leaders of Africa will need to become job creators as opposed to job seekers. It's only when we create the ecosystem, when you invest in that ecosystem, when we start protecting the intellectual property, we can actually then use the data to generate wealth, the information that we have generated in universities to create wealth for the country. This is where we ask for collaboration with the diaspora. We can coax them to spend some of the time because I forget about now about brain gain. I'm not, I'm, I'm talking increasing about brain, brain, brain drain, but I'm pro brain circulation. 
So we need to get all these people out there in the diaspora to come and spend some time with the people within. So we can then create these opportunities by up to this, 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 um, this clash of ideas uh, that can generate the sparks that can motivate the young people. So these are the, the building blocks that we need to invest in science. And why science matter for the continent? I'll just give you one simple example. I'll take the field of agriculture. Agriculture is a $1 trillion business. Agriculture will ensure food security, especially in the context that we're living right now, when there are some countries which are faced with you know, shortage of food. Africa, with 60% of her land, can become a powerhouse in agriculture. But how do we do that? Is to empower the woman with the tools of science. And once she has the tools of science, because let's not forget that women feed Africa. So we need to get her the knowledge. We need to get her the, 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 the access to capital. We need to get her with all the framework. We need to create the ecosystem so that she can feed, she can transform, she can create jobs. And this is why STEM matter for the continent. I've taken one example, but energy, water, you name it, it's all there. So we need to empower the youth. We need to empower them with the tools of science so that they can become that entrepreneur, take the data, cross the valley of death, and start becoming those who will be creating jobs for the younger people. Fantastic. Thank you so much because you brought... I think many of these things together by be giving very specific examples, Dr. Amina, of where the STEM that we keep talking about is being used. Agriculture, energy, transport, and you know, critical problem solving. Because sometimes you don't go to school for engineering and become an engineer. Sometimes school is just about training your mind to think about how to solve problems. I think, Minister Paula, before I go back and sort of give a round robin to everyone, I would like to say, I would like to give you an opportunity to say a little bit about government. Um, Dr. Amina spoke a little bit about policies, a little bit about entrepreneurship. You know, could you reflect on that for me? Because I know that you're very big on entrepreneurship, job creation. What perhaps is the government of Rwanda doing and thinking about this? And, you know, what, what are you hearing in these international halls where you sit? You know, what are we hearing about at a regional and international level? Thanks, Roland. And, and maybe before I come to that, I wanted to uh, just speak on something, and uh, which is really, uh, there was a question which was asked earlier around, um, you know, the choice of universities. I think it was asked by Joseline. Um, where she's finishing high school uh, and, and, you know, she's thinking about uh, college and wondering and, and feeling like, you know, the choice of college. And obviously, you know, we have this thing where most, uh, most uh, you know, young people are thinking if I go to study in the U.S., maybe that will guarantee more success for me. I think as someone who studied, who, who studied in Rwanda, yes, well, I agree that the choice of university uh, matters a lot. I also believe that even beyond um, you know, the choice of the university is how you decide to expose yourself to knowledge and networks beyond the university that you're in. Because you could find someone who is going to the best school in the world, but if you're not uh, really taking full advantage of all these other networks that are there for you, and, and we live in a world where now it's been made easy. Any topic that you want to be to have specialization in, you can go online and self-teach and, and get all these resources. That it doesn't matter whether or not you find yourself in, in, in any kind of university, you can still be an expert um, in, 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 in particular areas where you're passionate. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very delicate balance. Everyone wants to send their children, or we also always want to go to the best of schools, and which I, I'm, I'm a great advocate for. I say, you know, especially when I'm talking to girls, I'm like, go for the best um, because you deserve it. But should you not be able uh, to get the best or what you really wanted, it shouldn't be the end of the world. I think the key thing is to always say, what has life presented me with and how do I turn it around in, in the best way possible? Because somehow uh, that is what is going to get you ahead in, in, in your career. So yes, 
go for the best, look for the best school, but if you don't get into them, and I think there's someone who was asking about when they finish, I think from Rukara, where they say when they finish and they don't get a scholarship, then it's like they've wasted education. There's so many opportunities. There was someone once that 24 years, you're in the middle of, you know, a different um, choice of field, and then you realize you want to do STEM, you start all over with a four-year degree program, and then that's where I mentioned it in my response. That's where we have concepts like reskilling and upskilling coming in place, because they cater for that change of career that one would like to take. Even at 40 years, you can decide, look here, I, I, I no longer want to be an accountant. I'm interested in coding and you should be given that opportunity to do so. And that's why you have companies like Candela uh, that for them, and I remember when Candela came to Rwanda, some of their initial uh, cohort was someone who was working as a security guard, but for some reason who felt, and he was clocking 50, but he was like, I'm so, I'm so curious to understand this whole concept around coding. They brought him on board and he was able you know, to even thrive because he was already passionate about it. And so for me, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, whether you're still you're finishing secondary school and deciding where you want to go, or you've spent 20 years in your career and you want to pivot, there's always opportunities for doing so. But also we live in a world where there's a wealth of information and resources online that we can all, uh, you know, be, be, you know, leveraged to really um, allow us to, to get the skills that we need. Again, life is really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long learning experience. And once you have that in you, it doesn't matter what age you're in. And so Roland, very quickly, I know we are running out of time, but very quickly back to your question, what is being done? Um, you, you ask this question as, I, as we come out of a series of weeks of conversations around the digital divide. And this digital divide is, is, is so alarming in the sense when we think about the gender digital divide. We're talking about 2.9 million um, you know, people that still remain unconnected globally. Majority of those, close to 60% are women. A majority of those are women and girls in the African continent. So already when you look at that statistic, it, it, it tells a story, it tells a story that whether it's the policies, whether it's the programs that we design, what is it that we need to do differently to make sure that as we close on this 2.9 million, we still don't remain with the biggest gap, which is, which is girls and women that still remain uh, unconnected. And even just taking a few examples, I remember three years ago when we decided to come up with the Coding Academy, which is really, uh, we get students that are, have excelled in math and physics, when they're finished with their O level and they're getting into A level where they start to specialize in certain STEM fields. And we, we had to be deliberate and say, if we're going to take the top 60, 30 must be girls, 30 must be boys. And that has been a policy that we've gone by for three years now, where we make sure it's a 50-50 split. Why is that important? As I mean, think about Rwanda where you have about 6.58 million of the population that is girls and women. Uh, versus the 6.3 million, which is men. So if if you look at the global statistic where 28% of the workforce in the IT field is women, you can imagine the kind of products that we are creating and building are not representative of uh, the biggest segment of our population, which is girls and women. And so that's why it's important even as we, you know, that's why we keep pushing on, we want more women, we want more girls getting into STEM because we also want to have a balance of, of solution that is really looking at, at, at the unique needs that every, um, you know, any particular gender may have. Uh, the other thing that also from, and this is more really on skilling, but Roland knows very much because we have a, a huge program over the next five years that we're going to be working on that is looking at last mile connectivity, that is looking at device penetration, digital skilling. And in all of that, we're, being, we're intentional in how we design it to make sure that we have an eco split in terms of access and availability, whether we're going to be coming up with device financing mechanisms, how many women versus men, can we have a 50-50 split? How many women households have already done the numbers? We know how many women households we have in Rwanda and how do we ensure that they are also prioritized and given an opportunity to be uh, active um, digital natives and so I know I could say a lot and we're running out of time and I'm and, and happy to take this conversation offline but, I, but at the end of it I think what I wanted to take away is that for us it's very important not just because the government of Rwanda is, is, is big on women empowerment but also because the government of Rwanda is big on innovation and ICT as a key driver for growth and we cannot afford to leave women behind. 
Minister, thank you so much. I know that you actually have another engagement that started two minutes ago. So I want to just give my sincere thanks to all of you, Christelle, to Dr. Amina. Um, we touched on so many topics, right? We, talk, we touched on persons who are coming from, you know, maybe more modest means and backgrounds. We, talk, we touched on the imposter syndrome. We touched on, you know, persons lacking in confidence. We touched on, we had questions about um, the, 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 the salary gap, the, the gender gap. Um, in salaries, I would like to say, though, that mo in most cases, persons who study STEM are actually getting higher salaries anyway. There is still a gap between men and women. But in terms of being more in terms of the top of the food chain, it's actually another reason why you should be encouraged to focus on STEM, to have STEM education and STEM careers, because there is an opportunity to earn even more. We focused on the challenge of balance as a woman who is in a STEM, as a woman who's in a STEM career. Um, this was a broad ranging and a very rich discussion. And I know that we could be here easily for another hour. Um, I am going to turn this over though to my sister, Vemi Disu, um, Executive Director of Carnegie Mellon to wrap up for us. Um, and I just, just say thank you all of you so far who have been connected. I've just been very happy to facilitate the discussion. Bemi, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Roland. I don't even know where to start. What a dynamic session we've had. I am so, so grateful to my sisters, Isa and Roland for partnering with us on this very important initiative. I don't even know where to start with Dr. Amina who shared nuggets from being a proud mom to not focusing on a career path, but leading with passion. And what well, I love your take on like dream, dare, do. And as someone who also is trying to avoid the imposter syndrome, I will add that with my three C's, which is to do what you're advising. We need to remember that we need our women to be competent, to be confident, and to be consistent in delivering excellence. And this will help kind of overcome that imposter syndrome. Christelle, you're a breath of fresh air, your passion, you bring in sharing the relevance of what it is as a young woman in today going through, not discounting that it is easier than it was maybe in 1970s when Dr. Amina this person told her to study home economics, but there are still challenges that you will encounter as you move ahead in life. I want to thank, um, you mentioned the importance of parents and, and dads specifically across all three of you, the ability of the dads to inspire you to really go ahead and do what is important is so key. And for the women that don't have that in their lives, finding other champions and mentors who can do that is very critical. I love always said, even well-intentioned people can lead you astray in the case of um, Honorable Minister Paula, where she was advised to go into events management. So it's always key that people can mean well, but they're speaking from their own experience and their own limitations. And you don't need to ever take that upon you. And you should just push through and do what you're passionate about as long as you're focused and you have the willingness and the drive to exist in a space that you can make great contributions. So certainly I'm trying to be respectful of time. Um, this is such a great conversation, so rich. I have pages of nuggets um, that I can keep going on and on, but I just wanna thank everybody, thank our participants for engaging. I wanna remind you that this is a ongoing six month series and we have another one coming up in September and November. And so if you're fired up and can't wait to meet more incredible women such as Dr. Amina, Ms. Christelle and Honorable Minister, um, please join us later on this year and as we continue to have this conversation. And our hope is that this inspires more girls to follow their STEM passion, stay. One of the things is you can start, but as Christelle mentioned in her experience, 50% of the women dropped off. You have to, you have to have to be resilient and just stay through, overcome those challenges and just stay. It's worth it at the end for not just the paycheck, but for who you become in terms of helping other women up that food chain. So as Carnegie Mellon, we're so honored, honored to be able to have this session. I believe it was, um, 
um, Honorable Minister Paula that mentioned that, of course, women should aspire for the best schools. We like to think that's us. So we welcome all of you young women on the call to apply to Carnegie Mellon and join us in increasing the percentage of women that stay stay on this path for STEM education. Thank you all so much. Good day, good, good morning, good evening from wherever you're signing in from. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next session in September. Thank you to all our panelists and for everyone involved in this session. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Roland. Thank you. Thank you, Aisa. Thank you. Bye.